Welcome to part 2C1, the next to last of these shows about microfossils. Like the other protists, diatoms and radiolarians are listed on this University of California Museum of Paleontology protist wheel. Protists are eukaryotes, most of them are unicellular, and a majority are marine. In these shows, a distinction has been made between the plant light forms that obtain their energy from sunlight and those resembling animals that forage for food or as active predators prey on others. Diatoms are plant-like for they are powered by sunlight. The energy is stored in the test as tiny globules of oil created by photosynthesis. In general, radiolarians are animal-like for most are predators. Nevertheless, diatoms and radiolarians share one basic feature. Both construct skeletons of silica, a hydrated form of silicon dioxide called opal, a mineral highly resistant to erosion, so readily fossilizable, but easily altered by heat and pressure to chert, cryptocrystalline quartz. We start with the diatoms. Their siliceous test is called a frustule. The frustule consists of two valves. One, the hypotheca, capped by another slightly larger one, the epitheca. Frustules have a wide range of shapes but are either more or less circular in a form called centric or are elongate in a binary symmetry called pennate. Diatoms are classified into orders, families, genera, and species by size, shape, arrangement of pores, cell linking mechanisms, and ornamentation which includes spines, processes, hyaline areas, and in pennate forms, the presence or absence of longitudinal slits called rapi. These criteria are used to discriminate both living and fossil species and to establish group relationships. The structures and their relationships are named by what could be a plethora of terms, a few of which are listed here. The hierarchy of diatom classification and its nomenclature are still in dispute, but here you are looking at a tentative effort to resolve the problem. This uh, now familiar slide sketches the identifying characteristics of the five commonly recognized suborders. The three centric suborders are defined in accordance with the design of the test. It's a frustule tends to have a radial symmetry without polarities and to be circular with or without a discrete marginal band and processes. It is assigned the suborder Coscinodiscini. Here are some genera assigned this group. The pore patterns can be beautiful like this one. The frustules of the suborder Rhizosolineini are unipolar, elongate, and much thinner than the commonly drum-shaped Coscinodiscini. The genera of the suborder Bidolfiini are mainly bipolar. In general, the tests are relatively thick in girdle, that is, lateral view, but they range widely in shape and size. Some are colonial. Diatoms with elongate, generally bilaterally symmetrical valves are called pennates. They are placed in one of two suborders. The Bacillariini, those with raphe, a slit or slits between the valve faces of a monoraphid or a biraphid diatom. 
The most common site for the raphe is along the apical axis. Through the specialized pores in the slit, some diatoms extrude strands of mucilage that adhere to the substrate and by flowage provide them with locomotion. Penates without raphe are a sign of suborder Fragilariani. These too can exude mucilage. Here are used for fixation. Among them is this sometimes epiphytic Lycmophora flabellata. Many centrix and penates form chains that vary in length from two cells to 50 or more in straight, curved, spiral, or angular configurations. But some genera remain solitary. Cells of the chain may be rectangular or tubular and closely apressed with siliceous linking mechanisms or connected only by mucilage, an extracellular polymer in living and fossil forms that may be thread-like. The surfaces of chain cells may appear to be either rectangular or tube-shaped, but the frustules themselves maintain their opaline skeleton within the mass of extracellular polymers that envelop them. Some diatoms reproduce massively to form thick mats like this one. Asexual reproduction involves a cell division in which each of the valves of the parent frustule is the epitheca of a new cell. So there is a progressive decrease in the size of the frustule of one-fourth of the succeeding generations. At some point, vegetative reproduction of this fork ceases, and a large cell, an oxospore, with a well structure lacking silica, is formed by conjugation. The photos on this slide illustrate the process. The oxospore makes a new cell that has a maximum size frustule, and asexual reproduction begins again. In response to unfavorable conditions like depleted nutrient levels in the neuritic zone, many planktonic species develop a form with a stouter skeleton, a diatom resting cyst called a statopore. In some localities, Diatoms are the principal component of a rock. It is called diatomaceous earth and is mined for use as a mild abrasive, an absorbent filter, an insecticide, and as a recipient for an absorbent of the nitroglycerin of dynamite. But the opaline silica of the frustule alters readily to chert. So cherts are much more common than diatomaceous earths. The oldest recognizable diatoms have been reported in marine strata of Jurassic age, but they are well identified only in Aptian and younger formations. Their vast numbers make them invaluable for biostratigraphic correlation particularly in continental settings. The oldest diatoms in lake beds are dated late Cretaceous, and like all freshwater diatoms, are predominantly pennate. But pennates with raphe exist only in Eocene and Younger strata. Diatoms are also used extensively in establishing the biostratigraphy of marine strata particularly that of wells drilled on the sea floor. Owing to the exquisite responses of diatoms to changes in water temperature, purity, and silica content, their distribution is also studied rigorously for information on paleoclimate and paleocurrents. Today, in lakes and streams used for water supplies, their absence leads to an investigations for possible pollutants. 
the last of the microfossils. <laughs>